This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. Three games coming up tonight in the NBA playoffs. We're going to break down all three by talking to Brandon Gadula, getting his read on those three games, where he's seeing value right now, and a Sarah Betts at FanDuel Sportsbook, plus a preview of the Zurich Classic. Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire. Joined here, as mentioned by Brandon Gadula. Check him out on Twitter at Gadula13. You can find find his work over at numberfire.com brandon nba playoffs in full swing how you doing today i'm good uh didn't get to see um all of the uh, rbc heritage uh, this past weekend but i saw that the playoff between matt fitzpatrick and jordan spieth which was pretty sick so i watched a lot of basketball jim's got his head down i don't know oh the northwestern i'm wearing the Northwestern okay. hat in honor of Maddie Fitz today. I didn't yeah. wear it yesterday because I wasn't talking to you. Um, yeah, we weren't talking sense. golf at all. So I had to like, this is the only golf talk we have this week is this show since we're not doing the DFS side of things. So yeah. I had to get the the Maddie Fitz pride in here somewhere. So, and you hat for that. I'm assuming his brother did not go to Northwestern, but they're playing together this week, right? No, they're not playing together in the team event. They're playing together. Uh, next week when it's not a team event what is next week i don't actually look that far ahead i live in the moment sorry for trying to live in the moment brandon constantly living Um, on your phone trying to it's me always (laughs) yeah big phone guy (laughs) Uh, (laughs) trying to communicate with everyone oh yeah mexico open at vidanta then wells fargo okay well it's not that's fun but well i also i did watch some basketball too i just uh was leading off with the golf thing and then i figured it may be a more natural segue to go golf then basketball and then into basketball but you know it, it, it like busy weekend transition kings brandon yeah. gadula here yeah. to facilitate the podcast you're the, you're the point guard of all of this um making sure we remain on task uh you're not stomping on my chest you know i feel i appreciate that it's a very sportsmanlike <laughs> of you to uh keep that restraint so uh, we're gonna talk to brandon get, today don't get me started You have no hot takes on the Warriors. I know this. No hot takes on Draymond specifically. I I know that. You know, just this is how intimately I know you is. I know you have nothing you want to say about that matter. We'll dive into all three NBA games on tonight's slate, breaking down where Brandon is seeing value there. Then we'll talk about the Zurich Classic later on. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. We had Dr. Ed Fang on yesterday talking about uh, the UEFA Champions League. He talked about a bet that he likes uh, for one of tomorrow's matches so still plenty of time to get that bet if you agree with ed's logic there also talked about some nfl draft more nfl draft with ed coming up next week get all that by subscribing to covering the spread wherever you get your podcast and if you like what you hear leave us a five-star rating as well if you hadn't heard the nba playoffs are here and you can get in on the action right from first tip with FanDuel. Right now, all customers can get a no-sweat, same-game parlay every weekend when you bet the NBA playoffs. That's right. Just place a three-plus leg, same-game parlay, or same-game parlay plus on any NBA playoff game, and you'll get bonus bets back if you don't win. There is no better place to bet all the playoff action than America's number one sportsbook. Head to the FanDuel app and get a no-sweat, same-game parlay every weekend of the NBA playoffs. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. Must be 21-plus and present in select states. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. Bonus issued is non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash RG. Hope is here. Gambling helpline MA.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts. In New York, one 877 hope and wire Text hope and Y. In Arizona, 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 533 533- for two in Connecticut, one 789 7777 
or visit ccpg.org slash chat. In Indiana, 1-800-9 with it. In Wyoming and Kansas, 1-800-522-4700. Or in Kansas, ksgamblinghelp.com. Louisiana is 1-877-770-STOP. In Maryland, mdgamblinghelp.org. And in West Virginia, 1-800-GAMBLER.net. Let's dig in now to these Tuesday NBA playoff games. We got three of them, and they'll start off with the Hawks and the Celtics. Right now, the Celtics are 10.5 point favorites. Total here is 230.5. And, and in the game number one of the series, saw the Celtics get out to a massive lead early on. Did get a bit closer as things went along, but up one nothing here. How do you see things playing out in game two, Brandon? Yeah, what was it? A 30 point lead at halftime. Um, makes it hard to, to get a lot of takeaways unless your only takeaway is it's going to be a very one sided series. Uh, the spread indicates as much. Um, the total moving to 230 and a half is a bit problematic for me, but we'll get there in a second. Um, you know, I was on last week talking about how my process might differ for the playoffs. We were talking playing games, but um, one thing that I probably should have mentioned more is that with fewer games, it's a lot easier to dig in uh, to how games actually have, you know, how they went. Um, and one thing that really helps figure out how games actually progressed are it's the four factors, uh, which were, I guess, uncovered by Dean Oliver. Um, anyone who knows basketball analytics knows that name, but it's effective field goal position, which uh, effective field goal percentage, which accounts for, um, you know, the fact that three pointers are worth more than two pointers. So it's a, it's a better stat than just field goal percentage turnover rate, offensive rebounding rate and uh, free throws made per field goal attempt. Basically it's like all the ways that possessions can more or less end on offense. And you can figure out like through those stats, how things are going. Basketball reference has these for every single game. They color code them green and red. So you can see who's leading. So it's kind of, it, it, you know, it's really helpful when it's a simple way um, to look at things instead of just final score because it doesn't tell you a whole lot um, of how things went. But in this first matchup uh, between Boston and Atlanta, the Celtics easily led an effective field goal percentage, uh, 55% to 41%, terrible shooting game uh, for the Hawks. Um, that helped them run away with it despite an elevated turnover rate. Uh, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, each had 23 shot attempts, which you love to see. Love when these teams get their best players the ball and that they're not shying away from it. Um, for Atlanta, uh, DeJounte Murray, Trey Young combined one for 11 from three. So you expect some regression there uh, from that from that duo. Um, I had this spread at 10 points, so I'm not super interested in 10 and a half. Um, the total uh, as about an hour ago was 229 and a half, and I saw about a point and a half, maybe 1.8 points there, which is is fine on the over, but now it's down to about, you know, 0.7 points, something like that. So it's, it's would be my preference, but it's really not something that I'm overly eager uh, to go, you know, full unit with uh, on something that small. I do. I mean, if, if, you know, if this is something that fits your process, which I am getting better and better at, but Celtics money line uh, minus five ten. don't really see them dropping this game. I think mm -hmm. it's pretty lopsided. Uh, with this matchup, uh, the Hawks very average. We know the memes uh, from their their whole regular season, just floating around 500 constantly. I guess, I guess, if anything, it says that they'll win this game uh, to even out the series. But frankly, uh, it was just you know, it was such a bad shooting game uh, mm -hmm. for them that they're going to have to really figure. They're they're going to have to bounce back pretty hard uh, for this one. So. With this, with the total moving back up or moving up a point, yeah, don't see a whole lot right now. Um, hopefully, you know, if anyone was was into the over, they got it before it went up to two thirty and a half. But if anything here now, it's just going to be uh, the Celtics money line, which I'm always okay uh, in yeah. certain cases putting into parlays because it's I don't want to say it's, it's safe and it's definitely not. A guarantee, but I, I really do think that that everything points to another Celtics victory here. Implied odds of minus five ten are eighty three point six percent. I want to go back to you mentioned the shooting for the Hawks. Is that a situation where the eye test can help you? Where you know you watch this game, you can identify were they shooting poorly because the defense was clamped down, they had to force stuff, or was it just 
they were off for a specific night. Is this a spot where you think the eye test can really help you in kind of identifying whether regression will actually come? You can say eye test, but you can also just look at the math. And they were 10 yeah. points worse than the worst team in terms of effective <laughs> field goal percentage for the regular season. So it's going to yeah. go back up unless yeah. they really are just you know ice cold. But uh, so, again, it should be a little bit closer. Um, not necessarily to the point where I think that I want the Hawks to cover because I could feel this one kind of slipping away from them again. In the second half, I don't really know if they have a whole lot of answers uh, for slowing down Boston. Just a pretty deep team. Um, just it's look the NBA playoffs. We get a lot of lopsided matchups. The Hawks are have been average, as we mentioned, the whole regular season. Boston is one of the best teams in the league. The thing about basketball, it, I'm not saying that it's even predictable, but you know we get roughly 100 possessions for each team every game. That stuff evens out. You look at football; it's just like frankly a handful of possessions sometimes a lot of fluky things can happen basketball the better team wins very often especially over the full series but you know it's just it's too close for me uh to want to get here aside from the the celtics money line which i'm okay with so the books are expecting a similar game in game two for that one the same cannot be said for the knicks and the Cavs. right now the spread there is five and a half despite the fact the knicks won at game one they are five and a half point dogs here total for this game is 214 brandon knicks win game one five and a half point dogs here any value for you in this game at fanduel so the knicks dominated the uh the offensive glass which bears out in the numbers, uh, almost a 39% offensive rebounding rate. Just as again, that's one of the four factors. Um, they looked like they were hungrier, which I, I don't, I don't love because I do still have a soft spot for the Cavaliers. Um, as you dig into analytics, you lose your rooting interest, or at least I do. Um, I know that Jim's not, not a big jets fan anymore. Right. Uh, I do my chat paints and figuring here, <laughs> you know, for old time's sake though. Yeah, it, so it, like it happens, but um, that helped them win despite having a really bad effective field goal percentage, 46.6%, league low this year, 51.6%, uh, but Cleveland also uh, below below that mark too, just kind of an ugly game, but also the pace, um, just under 91 possessions. Uh I mean, it sounds weird, but like pace is kind of hard to calculate. There's like a bit of a formula to it. So it's not just number of possessions always. It's kind of derived by different stuff. But, you know, that's lo- that's on the low end. And that's actually what we've seen from these two teams when they've played uh, very often uh, is that th- these games just are are slowed down. Um, as for this game itself, I mean, Julius Randle, 10 three-point attempts, which is a bit on the higher end for him. I'd like to see him be a little bit more aggressive. Uh, but... Interested to see how the the Cavaliers try to, you know, improve their defense on Jalen Brunson. Uh, Chetty Osman had a seemed like he has having a, a tough time down the stretch. Brunson twenty seven points on twenty four shots in in the opener, um, but then for Cleveland also like they're going to need someone to step up alongside Donovan Mitchell. He had thirty eight in the opener. Uh, Evan Mobley four for 13, 11 boards, but like they're going to need a secondary scorer here. Um, I have this spread as Cavs minus six. So, you know, it, it's another what I would call efficient line here based on yeah. um, my numbers. But I think the Cavaliers need to figure out their rebounding situation. And like that's one of those that's one of those things where we talked last week about the eye test and, and feeling like you might know a thing or two and yeah long like the long-term data here says Cavs still you know in play uh to cover here but don't really like the matchup they they haven't played the Knicks very well all season so it's like data says there's a little bit here mine says it might you know their efficiency might be scaled back against the Knicks the Knicks might be a little bit better against the Cavaliers based on matchups so for me what I'm going to I'm actually kind of going against what the model says uh, again is the under uh, 214 in this one. Um, these matchups have fallen short. Uh, there are five matchups this season fallen short of the total by an average of 9.1 points. Although there were two overs out of those five games, but an average of uh, two, 210, uh, uh, 210.8 uh, in these games. 
And, you know, you can't just look at like, okay, here are four or five games of, of two matchups and this is exactly how you should bet an over under. But I really don't see this pace ramping up a ton. I do see the shooting efficiency being a bit better, but the pace itself is going to be really low. And I, I have a hard time betting overs when I think teams just want to grind down the clock and play it slowly. Uh, so it's close enough where I'm okay uh, with the under. Um, and that's, I think, the best route to this game. Although I, I do think that the Cavaliers bounce back and get the win uh, for anyone who's interested in the money line. But that spread a bit too close for me to want to, to to think that they can cover that um, and win by six. Yeah, just 198 total points in the first game. Uh, 214 here, the total for the second one. Brandon does like the under there due to um, the shooting, due to... All these factors combined, the low pace, all combined, and make under 214 his favorite option there. Final game of the night is the Clippers and the Suns. Clippers got a big win in game number one, but this spread has lengthened. It was 7.5 at open. It's now 8.5. Total is 225.5. What are you seeing with this one for the nightcap? Yeah, I also hate that extra point. Um, <laughs> well, it was disappointing. At least the market is moving the, the same direction you wanted to go. Like, it might not be great for listeners, but it's good for but, the model validating what it said, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's the fact that uh, things moved before uh, right. recording. That, right. That's that's tough here. Um, but yeah, not a lot of turnovers in this opener. Uh, the Suns narrowly led an effective field goal percentage, uh, 51 to uh, 49.5% there, but uh, the Clippers, again, hit the offensive glass hard. Another uh, similar situation to what we saw with Knicks and Cavs, but overall, again, by those four factors, pretty even game overall. Suns got some really balanced scoring from Kevin Durant, uh, Booker, Aiton, Torrey Craig had a nice game, uh, but here's where things get a little tricky is that, you know, Kawhi Leonard played well, uh, and I should mention Paul George is, is out, uh, just as a reminder, um, he got, he had 38, uh, Kawhi, not Paul George, Kawhi had 38 points on 24 shots. Um, and they kind of like, I know Russ ended up being, um, a hero down the stretch, but not the best game for him. Efficiency wise, nine points on three of 19 shooting in 36 minutes, uh, productive, you know, otherwise, but kind of a rough scene there. So now what we're looking at is like, yeah, the Clippers won, took a really, really efficient, you know, point per shot basis from Kawhi Leonard. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to like knock the rest of the Clippers, like Eric Gordon at 19, uh, Norman Powell 14, uh, Zubots 12. But I don't know if, if Russ is going to shoot the same way that he shot in this game. Kawhi maybe takes a step. It, it almost feels like Kawhi in the playoffs just, is untouchable at, at certain times, but it kind of felt like the breaks went in their favor. Um, the problem there is the, all of the data when the suns are healthy points to, they should, they should have a commanding advantage in this lead in this series with Paul George out, but they dropped game one. Now for them to bounce back and win by nine, um, I could see them kind of, I could see this one being close throughout and then the sun's pulling away once the offensive limitations right now for the Clippers kind of hit them. But again, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I, I mean, I do have, I do have the spread at, at uh, 9.9 okay. in favor of the suns. So it, it is the best spread of the night um, for sure. So I'm interested there, but I, I do like the over, uh, in this game, that's probably my favorite route of the entire night uh, is the over in this game. I think that, again, I, I called out the scoring uh, limitations for the Clippers, uh, but I think that the Suns can really bounce back, have a really good offensive game here, um, and the pace is not not nearly as bad, but about 100 possessions in this game. So I think it's really promising uh, for an over in this matchup. The total again is 225 and a half right now. The over is minus 110. The spread Brandon mentioned half in favor of the Suns. That is also minus 110. Is that a bet for you or a lean on the Suns spread minus eight and a half? I will take it. Okay. I liked it a lot more at seven and a half. Sure. As always, <laughs> wish we could record it, you know, seven o'clock night before. I guess for yeah, these yeah. even earlier because they're posted pretty early. But yeah. um 
again, I think it's encouraging that the numbers are moving your direction. It's interesting that the spreads have lengthened on the favorites here for the two teams that lost game one. Um, not sure if that's people trying to, you know, overcompensate for stuff or whatever, but it sounds like there is still value for you in the Cavs to an extent, but also to the Suns at minus eight and a half. I, I would, I would throw out a Celtics Suns money line parlay, um, which is minus one eighty eight on Fanduel Sportsbook. I have those odds around minus two fifteen. Okay, so that's value as well. Uh, the individual legs there, minus 355 for the Suns, minus 510 for the Celtics, uh, minus 188, as Brandon mentioned, for the two of them parlayed. He has it at minus 215. That's actually pretty good value. So I find that intriguing as well. Okay, that's going to wrap up the NBA for today. As mentioned this week in the PGA, we got a team play event. It's the Zurich Classic. And Brandon, because there's no DFS for this event, and I haven't been... Uh, my foray into betting three balls aggressively in golf happened more recently than last year. I've not had a lot of interest in this event in the past. So what should we know about this event before placing wagers? And uh, what are the key things to know here? Yeah, so it's a team event. But what does that mean exactly? Well, it's, uh, I guess, 80 groups of two uh, making up the teams. It's not like a like a Ryder Cup format, but... Mm. Uh, format for the actual golf um, since 2018, when the format switched over, uh, it's four ball, which is better ball uh, in the first and third rounds, and then alternate shot or foursomes for the second and fourth rounds, meaning guys play the same ball for those two rounds. So it does make for interesting viewing, but anyone who even is not familiar with golf could understand uh, why it might be tricky to get a read on something it's almost like um you know maybe not as drastic but for for two of the rounds like a new like a rotating quarterbacks for every play or something like that like, i'm into that let's propose it let's it would do be, it i mean the saints can do it but uh can they quarterbacks. but yes <laughs> but but it, it's tricky and you know over the years you kind of get well you, you sort of hear like well it's a team event it's really volatile it's hard to predict but i never i don't quite see it that way like there is more volatility and it's it's a lot trickier uh but the past winning teams have been jonas blix and cam smith uh billy horschel and scott piercy ryan palmer and john rom who actually complement games pretty well even though people don't think that uh at the time they did uh mark leishman and cam smith and then Patrick Cantlay and Xander Shoffley last year, who set a course record, or I get, I guess, an event record. But um, the like the runners up have been pretty notable. I do think that it's one of those situations where, like, yeah, it's it's tough, and maybe one one of the better, like, stronger players paired with someone else who's not quite as as good, or guys whose games maybe don't mesh the right way, um, like. It, it, those guys can get knocked down, but if you take two good golfers and put them together, they're probably going to golf pretty well together. And that's why uh, Patrick Cantlay and Xander Schauffele are, are what plus two ninety to win this week on FanDuel Sportsbook. It's a bit tough because yeah. um, it still is a golf event, and there's a lot of volatility in that. Those two guys are golfing phenomenally well right now, and it almost feels like they're going to be in contention no matter what. Uh, but you know, I, as far as like the course setup goes, uh, TPC Louisiana does tend to favor distance a bit. It's, it's over 7,400 yards. And like one of the harder wrinkles here is that the greens are smaller than average. They're like 5,200 square feet on average. PG tour average is around 6,000 square feet. A lot of bunkers, uh, waters and play on eight holes. So like that adds to even more of the volatility, but again, like the winners are not, Super surprising. Uh, you know, we know that Cam Smith is pretty legendary, so it's not that surprising to see him uh, with those two wins. In in examining like Ryder Cups and Presidents Cups, I will say that good tee to green duos are not the worst way to go because mm -hmm. then you get more birdie chances, and um, I think that's very very appealing uh, for this week. But yeah, that's kind of like the nuts and bolts of what you need to know about this event. It is a bit tricky. It's not completely random, and I'm I'm not necessarily looking for like mega long shots to knock off because we have some good teams. Sure. Um, 
you know, uh, especially, you know, at the very, very, very top, Patrick Cantley, Xander Shoffley, Colin Moore, Callum, Max Homa, probably going to be a very popular pick, that duo. It's easy to root for there. But Billy Horschel, Sam Burns, Matt Fitzpatrick and his brother, Alex Fitzpatrick. So, like, Fitz coming off the win, um, you know, it's hard to kind of figure out how they're going to play together. Maybe they play together really, really well, but we don't really know that. Uh, right. Yeah, you know, see what Cam Tom Cam is a fun pairing. So like we we have we have names toward the top, and I think that uh, you know at least one of those duos is going to be uh, someone that I kind of hone in on uh, for this week. Yeah. So the betting options for this week a bit more limited because it's a more unique event. So we don't have the full menu we typically would get. But when you look at the betting options for this week, whether it be outrights. Uh, finishing position, stuff like that. Anything you like right now at FanDuel Sportsbook, or is it going to be a pretty slimmed down week for you? It will be slimmed down, but mm-hmm. I think there are some things that at least make sense. Um, you know, it, this one's tougher to simulate out, but you can do it. Um, the fact, I mean, like not a shocker, but the, the numbers uh, for me liked Xander Shoffley and Patrick Kelly last year, and they got it done finally. So like, that's good to see, but this year, actually, one of the duos I did not mention is like one of the better duos: uh, Keith Mitchell and Sung Ji Im, uh, plus thirteen hundred on FanDuel Sportsbook. I like that. I think that's the best route to go as far as the outrights go among the top of the board. Combined, they just did a lot of fairways, have good irons overall. Uh, if you average out their total stroke skiing numbers over the past fifty rounds, they're they're the third best group in the field. Like to see that, you know, can't land Shawflay or or a you know, comfortably above them. And then uh, Morikawa and Homa about a half shot above this duo. But I I do think that this team makes sense. Um, Again, should be in in play. Shouldn't really put each other into bad positions whenever they're sharing the ball. And I think that's got to help. Plus probably going to be a pretty laid back duo. I also would love like, a mesh of those two, like Keith Mitchell's off the T numbers with Sung JM everywhere else. Like Keith Mitchell's not bad elsewhere, but like you combine that with Sung JM, like that could be pretty fun. Like as an actual like golfer too. Yeah. That was all I had. Anyway. Just, uh, <laughs> well, would it be Sung J Mitchell or, or Keith M? I think so. Um, Sung J Mitchell. We'll work on it. We'll get the interns on this to decide what the actual like mashup with that of that would be. I think um, Rick Rungood on Twitter uh, said Homakawa for uh, Colin Morikawa and Max Homa. I like that one. So we need a full rundown. Uh, you said 80 pairings. If you can give me all 80, uh, what their mashup names would be, I would like that. What about finishing positions, uh, round leaders, anything like that where you see value for this week? Oh, I, um, another uh, outright I think makes sense, but Again, I'm not going to fault anyone for just taking like a top ten here, but JJ Spawn, Hayden Buckley, uh, thirty-seven to one. Uh, both They're are good. Off thirty-two the team. people are on them. They're <sighs> down to thirty-two. <laughs> all right, that's all right. That's all right. That's all right. Um, both are pretty Recoup, good. Off the team. Uh, pretty average irons, but I think they'll complement each other's games well. Eighth in the field in average strokes gain total over the past fifty rounds, according to Data Golf. So. I'm good with that, and now we can move on to uh, two f- two finishing position uh, tandems that I think make some sense. First is a top ten at plus three thirty. Robbie Shelton, a spreadsheet ruiner, and Lee Hodges, pretty good tee to green duo. And again, that's something that um, the, the 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 sort of team play research I've done in the past for Ryder Cups and Presidents Cups say that, and it makes sense. Um, you don't want to have your, you don't want to put your, your partner in a position where they got to, they got to be the one to sort of help you get up and down. So you want to hit more greens again, smaller greens, but still uh, and, and their 16th and strokes gained average over the past 50 rounds. And then a top 20 that I think makes sense. Joseph Bramlett and Brandon Wu just plus one thirty five, but a lot of really bad teams in this event, which is what it is. A lot of like big, big negative numbers is, is combined teams, which you, you don't love. Uh, but Bramlett and Wu, 19th and combined, or average, I guess it'd be the same, same divisor. Is that right? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> 19th and strokes gained average. Uh, T to green, pretty good. They're both basically good ball strikers, but 
not good putters. So maybe they feed off of each other's bad putting energy, um, which is, is, is tricky, but it is only a top 20 uh, plus plus one thirty five. Yeah. I think it makes sense for getting again, two good guy, uh, two good ball strikers uh, paired up together. So that's Wu and Bramlett, top 20 at plus 135. You got Shelton and Hodges, plus 330 for a top 10. Spawn and Buckley, 32 to 1 to win. And then also Mitchell and M, 13 to 1 to win this week for the Zurich Classic. That is all that we have here for today on covering the spread. Brandon, thank you as always for swinging by, talking some NBA, talking some PGA. Have fun this week, and we'll talk to you again soon. Yeah, it's always fun. Uh, hope everything works out. And for once, I think I'm going to root against uh, my guy Xander so that somebody else can win who's not plus 290. I mean, sports books just conspire to keep you rooting for him usually, and they've done the opposite this week. You know, keep giving him 25 hey. to 1, hard not to bet him, hard not to root for him, but plus 290, that'll do the trick. Almost, uh, almost worked out last week. Yep, it did. Indeed. Either way, regardless. Thank you, Brandon. As always, find Brandon on Twitter at Cadula13. Check out his work over at numberfire.com. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J I M S A N N E S. As mentioned, our preview of the UCL matches for Tuesday, Wednesday is up over on Covering the Spread. Also, talks some NFL draft with Dr. Ed Fang. Get that there over or over on the FanDuel YouTube page. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 